So today is all about LoRaWAN devices. And before we dive into this hands-on workshop by Arduino, I first want to give you some theoretical background um, so you're well prepared to dive into this workshop. So we have so many devices out there, um, but all of them have something in common. And that's the ability to modulate binary data to an electromagnetic wave. And this electromagnetic wave can be sent wirelessly um, and is received by the gateway. And this gateway, again, can demodulate this electromagnetic wave into a binary data that can be processed. So this modulation and demodulation, that's the part that's so special in this LoRa technology. Important to understand is that devices operate, can operate in different classes. And starting with class A, that's the class that all devices need to support. And what it means is that in, when you operate devices with class A, the device always initiates the, um, the, the, the communication. So devices start with an uplink with a, in a transmission. And once it's finished with its transmission, it opens to receive window slots and it allows the network server to send a message back to the device. So we call this the RX1 or the first receive window and the RX2 or the second receive window. So usually, at least how we implemented this within the Think stack, the first receive window opens five seconds after the transmission and the second receive window opens one second after the first receive window. So it would mean RX1 would open in five seconds and RX2 would open at six seconds. So that's all class A and that's also what we're going to use during this course. But we, there are more classes. So there's class B and that means that the device opens uh, downlink windows at predefined time slots. So let's say every 10 seconds or maybe every minute and it allows the network server to send a message to that device. And we have class C and that is about continuous listening. So the device is always listening uh, for incoming downlinks. And this actually requires a lot of energy. So devices in class C usually don't operate on batteries, but are plugged in uh, the power socket. So devices operate in a certain regional area. And it's important to know that there is no globally harmonized frequency within LoRaWAN. So dependent on the region where you are, you use a different frequency. So in Europe, we use the frequency around 868 megahertz. In the US, it's around, it's around 915. In, in Australia or Asia, it's centered around 923. Um, so make sure you have the right hardware and that you use the right software by first looking at okay, what's the region, what's the regional parameter I should use in my area. So once you know your regional um, uh, area, then it's time for your devices to start an activation with the network server. And there are two ways to do so. You can use over-the-air activation and you can use activation by personalization. And first thing I want to say, like always use over-the-air activation because this is the better, the more secure way of, of joining a network server. You can always use, also use activation by personalization in let's say development or experimental settings, but I would not recommend it because you hard code the security keys in your device. And it makes it very hard to change that over time. With over-the-air activation, you can basically negotiate or create new securities um, at random intervals to keep your devices secure. And it also helps a lot with, let's say, changing network servers over time. So let's walk through this whole process. So we first have root keys, and that is the application key. And in later LoRaWAN version, we also have a network key. And um, this is the root key that we're going to use. So you register that key in the device as well as in the network server. Next up, we register the application EUI, which is also sometimes referred as the join EUI in later LoRaWAN versions. 
um, which we're also going to register in both the device and the network server. And finally, we have the device EUI, and um, that is most of the time given by the device manufacturer. Um, so we also register that information in the network server, so everything is aligned. Next up is the device sends a joint request message. So in this joint request message, it adds its um, app EUI or joint EUI and a device EUI. Um, and that message is processed by the network server. So if all the data seems correct, then the network server is generating session keys, uh, which is the application session key and the network session key. Um, and in later version, there are another few session keys that, that come into play here. And the network server sends a join accept message back to the device. And in a join accept message, uh, the network server has a device address that the device will use from that moment on. And it also adds some Mac configuration on the device, how the device should behave, what frequency channels to use, etc. And eventually the device receives that message and if it receives that message, it generates using the same procedure that the network server uses to also generate the same session keys. And this is a full loop starting from the device um, and that, that makes sure your device is properly um, configured to that network server. So this is also what we're going to use during the workshop. And the activation by personalization, that is, yeah, there, there, there's, there's no real uh, method involved. It's, it's merely the act of hard coding the device address and the session keys in your device and registering the same information in the network server. So once your, de once your device has an active session with the network server, it is time to start sending data. And there are different data rates that the device can choose to send its data. So it can choose to send the data very fast. So it uses a high data rate or a low spreading factor. Um, but it can also choose to use a very high spreading factor or a very low data rate. And the advantage of this is this, this method is that a uh, if you use a lower data rate, then actually you can send your data further away. Because how faster the data is sent, how harder it is to decode the signal from the gateway. So if you reduce the transmission speed, you are, um, you'll be receiving more range. But watch out, always try to go for the highest data rate, because we don't want to waste airtime. If all devices are always using, always sending on the lowest data rate, then like, like the whole air will be cluttered with lower one messages. And to give you an example, if you send a 10 byte message using SF7, it will take about 60 milliseconds to, for the message to be sent. But if you use the same message and you use spreading factor 12, it takes about one and a half seconds. And it takes a lot of resources and also a lot of energy from the device. So always go for the lowest spreading factor and the highest data rate. And if you want to learn more, we actually have a very nice tool online. So it's our airtime calculator. So go to this link and then you actually can play around with the different spreading factors and see how that reflects the airtime. So LoRaWAN, it's, it's, it's mainly known for its low power capabilities. But if we look at a device and how it operates, then it, it works like this. So a device is in deep sleep for most of the time and at some point it wakes up because it has a time interval, let's say every hour it wakes up and measures some sensors, but it can also be that a sensor triggers the device to be woken up. So it wakes up, it does some, temp, some, some sensor measurement and at some point it, it sends a message and sometimes that's followed by a, a message that it receives and eventually it goes back to sleep. So if you then look at how much energy all those um, uh, uh, phases consume, then we see that if a device is in deep sleep, it, it barely uses any power. So let's say about 10 microamps. If, an if it's an active mode, then it already spikes up to about three milliamps. 
During the transmission, it uses about 40 milliamps, which is actually quite a lot of energy. Uh, and also the receive, receiving a, a, a message consumes quite some energy. And if you look at the, the, the last row of this table, the last column, then you actually see what the implications are of using that specific mode if you just relate it to two AA batteries. So if it's in deep sleep, it can run for years and years on the battery. But if you always, if you send data too frequently, then um, it, like your battery will drain in, in, in days or weeks. So make sure you put your device in deep sleep for as much time as possible and really try to reduce the amount of messages you send because this will have a massive impact on your battery. To give you an idea on this, I, I, I took a, um, a, a measurement from Koitec. So Koitec is a company that provides very accurate power um, analysis tools. And here you can see the flow of so, or this whole process of sending a message. So you can see that the, uh, that, 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 um, the graph spikes up to 40 milliamps and then it goes to 10 milliamps and eventually it goes back to deep sleep mode. And the green line shows what it looks like when you use spreading factor 7, so the highest data rate. Um, and you see that it, it, it's all very rapidly, it goes very fast. But if you use the same message using spreading factor 12, then actually see that it's going to be way more airtime and also way more energy. So keep in mind, always go for the lowest spreading factor and try to limit the amount of data you send and the amount of messages because this has significant impact on your battery. Welcome to my second part of my lecture about LoRaWAN devices. And I very briefly discussed the part about power consumption and energy consumption of LoRaWAN and devices. But because this is such a vital part of LoRaWAN, um, because it's actually crucial to many IoT use cases, I invited an expert to um, tell, talk a bit more about this specific part. So I got with me Vanya. Vanya is the CEO and founder of Koitec, which is a Swedish-based company which does a lot of um, highly advanced energy analysis. And um, yeah, so welcome Vanya. You want to say a few more words about who you are and, and what do you do? Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, so we at Coitec uh, strive to develop uh, developer tools that will um, help uh, anybody in the stack to work with uh, energy optimization. And uh, in contrast to what many of you probably have seen um, in um, university lab or a company lab, we are actually uh, doing something that is easy to use, still very comprehensive, but very easy to use for the developers. Uh, we think the developer tools are a major part of uh, um, energy optimization and getting that uh, longer battery um, time. And uh, you have probably seen our product at the arc throughout the LoRaWAN um, community. It's extensively used. And uh, I mean, um, this is a simple setup um, that I'm going to show here and how it looks like. In this case, for example, we are uh, measuring a, a generic node, the, uh, the things network generic node that we have had, um, uh, had in our lab uh, testing. And the setup is very simple. And OT Arc is a power analyzer, power supply, and uh, log sync all in one, something that uh, every developer needs uh, on their table. Perfect. All right, we're going to dive into your tool set in a bit. Um, but maybe before we, before we start, so quite often when I like, look on the internet, if I see my LinkedIn, then there are so many advertisements about more one devices that promise five years, sometimes even 10 years of battery consumption. Is it actually feasible or is this a kind of myth? <laughs> 
Uh, the the simple answer is uh, it depends. And I know it's not fair to say that, but it truly does. Um, and I think one major thing what it depends on is the application in itself. Um, so you really need to understand and know your application. What are you trying to do? Um, it depends very much whether you are going to be sending the data very often, listening very often. Is it going to be in a certain environment? Um, is it going to be mobile or non-mobile? There's so many different aspects of it. And, once you know what your application is, your normal application is, and then what are the kind of corner cases of it, you will then um, be much more fitted to um, get into the deep dive of the low power and the uh, battery life. And to do that, then you need, I usually say kind of three things. One is you need to really be um, very good at picking the technology the right technology for what what you want to be doing and then the right components obviously the low power one and the settings right uh, to to do that uh the second one is the you need to have the engineering skills and uh testing you really need to do that and uh, i understand that it's not something that there's something gained you know with experience but uh low power mindset is uh, all about practicing and working on it and then the third one is actually having the right tools to kind of help you throughout this and um, not being limited, always having the um, insight of what is happening throughout the development project. Because when you start with something, throughout the iter iterative kind of um, ways of working in development, um, you this will change. And you need to understand what has been changing. Uh, so you don't end up setting a goal, of, let's say energy budget, and you're not meeting them. Um, this is actually very common. This happens quite a lot. People um, having one assumption and then at the end of the day, at the end of the project, they're not reaching them and there are delays in the project and uh, there are issues there and you don't want to end up there. Yeah. So you say you need the hardware to support it, you need the mindset and you eventually need the tools to test. Uh, and develop. Yes, that, that would be kind of the overall high high level. Like, okay, if you think, uh, I usually say that like the most thing, good things come in three, right? So it's much easier to 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 remember them. Mm, yeah, yeah, nice. Mm -hmm. Okay, this sounds very cool. Um, but like, what does it mean in practice? So we, we dive into a workshop in a bit where students actually mm -hmm. gonna go hands on with with devices. So yeah, like, how would that work in practice? Uh, well, again, um, I I will give let me give you like three three key best practices. Uh, one would be um, engineering your application and your the technology components that you you're picking. Uh, the second one would be engineering your device to sleep, and the third one would be to pick the right energy source for your application specifically. Mm -hmm. And if we go kind of digging into each of these, um, let's start the first one, engineering kind of around the technology and the system and the ecosystem you're in. Um, for example, in LoRaWAN, you, you know that most of the power from the system perspective would be um, depending on the um, time on air and the output power, right? So um, assumably you would want to then be less spending less time on air to um, not to consume much power, right? So you need to yeah. really understand how that works and how will that work in the connection with your application. Yeah. Uh, you so will the less time on air, I guess it would mean either send less uplinks or use a lower spread effect. Is that correct? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, it, and the, again, it depends a bit on what you want to be achieving. Uh, but uh, I mean, for example, spreading factor is one one of these key parameters that a lot of people are interested in, and they they might not actually matter at all if you're choosing a device class that is continuously sending and receiving, right? But if you're in a class of uh, um, a device, like a class A, then you definitely will have some benefits in kind of putting effort on what we, what sparing factor is the best for you. And um, let me give you an example. For example, e, uh, we have a measurement um, here. Let me just uh, kind of bring it up. And what is interesting here is that we have a um, couple of these measurements and we have done it with the different types of uh, the um, 
uh, spreading factors. In this case, we have a spread, spreading factor that is um, 12 and spreading factor that is um, 7. And of course, when you're talking about spreading factors, you, you would um, say the one that is longer on the air, you have more robustness to it and you will get a little bit more coverage. But if you are on air um, less of the time, you will obviously have um, much more, uh, much less of the energy cons consumed. And this is a, a perfect example now when you kind of overlap them in the measurement and see what the difference really is. Um, but let me, for example, say this is typically a case here where you would um, say have a kind of a normal um, uh, placement. It's quite nice, close to the gateway. You have a maybe line of sight. Everything is fine. Everything's uh, working well. But maybe you place uh, another one somewhere else, and then you realize that, wow, my uh, I'm not getting any acknowledgments on what I'm actually um, transmitting. Let's say, which means uh, that you now have to repeat the message. And suddenly, for example, let me unhide here, and you will see that. Now the same message, even though you're having a spreading factor that is really low, you will expect lower power consumption. The repeating is obviously going to cause more um, power to be yeah. consumed. So here you really need to have these um, skills and know your application really well to understand how you're going to be setting these. And this is what I mean by kind of engineering the technology, um, understanding the technology aspect and what they, the technology itself can contribute with the uh, actual low power. And then what can you do on your side, on your device side to uh, utilize this in a, in a best possible way? Yeah, um, exactly. Because so it really that, looks that was, like quite a significant difference, spreading effect of seven and spreading effect of 12. Yeah. So I would say that, I mean, if, if we go into the, I mean, that, that is from the technology and like kind of picking the right components. I mean, most of the components now are getting better and better and being low power, um, meaning that you would expect them to, to, to do their, their kind of work, but you have to see it also from the perspective of they might yeah. be used in different environment and uh, different constellations, different contexts, and that might that means that you have to think about it. You can't be very, you can't just have one path with one user case. You have to have these corner cases as well. And yeah. if you go into the second, uh, second um, kind of key practice is the engineering for sleep mode. Now, I think, um, for the IoT, this is really feasible because most of the applications are such that you don't really necessarily have to be working all the time. And uh, that means that if you can shut down things, if they're not making any uh, sense or any purpose at the moment, shut them down. Don't, don't have things uh, working and draining the battery. And it, it is easier um, said than done, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, especially now that, for example, you you might have peripheral components out there, there on the on the on the board that are doing something that you're not really used to or in the in the integration they are alive more than or they are uh, awake much more than you thought they would be so you have kind of have to hands on uh, check that um, yeah. so it's dividing things into subsystems so checking them. But also it can be very simply like a lot of microcontrollers uh, manufacturers right now they they deliver. Um, they deliver a lot of things um, up and running per default, and that is to um, actually help developers because most of the developers start by doing things, debugging things, testing things, and they want to have everything up and running. But you have to have in mind that eventually this is going to be a product, eventually you're going to go into production and you're going to release it. So you have to really make sure that you shut down everything. Um, yeah. and. I do have an example of that, actually. The, we recently measured that we were actually playing with the generic node on, on this specific topic. And yeah. it was, uh, um, let me show here, for example, it is um, the case of UART being on. And UART is something that usually communications is used for debugging purposes. Um, and it's um, something that will drain, obviously, uh, current because um, it's a data being transferred back and forth. Yeah. So you have to be aware of that, of, of that when you're doing debugging. However, most of the engineers might actually, you know, you work with that and then you submit your firmware and then you realize, oh God, I forgot to turn this or this or this off. Yeah, and you yeah. can be one of those or it's really common case. And yeah. for example, you can see here, 
we have the um, you are uh, measured for for um, um, this is actually in the yellow you have without you are and then um, um, duty cycle with with uh, so what's the current exactly with and without you are so what you will see here is in the corner that um, if we are looking now only on the active active um, uh, case you would see that the um, without the UART you will have maybe 3.23 milliamps is here whereas with the uh, with UART you will have 3.3 so it's not much difference because we are looking at the active point of it so here you would say well it's not making any difference it's pretty good it's fine but then we go into this uh, um the la the kind of the world of sleep and deep sleep if you then check this um specific measurement where we actually are measuring the current with and without the uart and we are getting now with uart uh 62.9 microamps and then without two microamps so you you see the difference mm -hmm. it's a huge yeah. difference and since your device is in sleep mode this will obviously cause um, a huge problem. And we actually calculated this, uh, that uh, in the case where you actually forget the UART to turn it off, you will have about five months of the battery life. Whereas if you really uh, have a firmware that is optimized and, and turned off this, you will have up to six years of the battery life. So, so simple things like that and there are many more of that like especially like i said in, in the microcontroller there are a lot of things that might be um um hanging there um unused pins and so on that you kind of have to turn off so those are the that that's it that is uh, very much about sleep and there's obviously much more to dig in but i think this yeah. is this is one of those typical cases but yeah like eventually a device is like almost always in deep sleep mode it's only waking up maybe a few times a day or once an hour to to do some calculations and to send a message so like, getting yeah. the sleep mode right is really crucial yeah so the majority of the time is spent in sleep mode which means that that is where you have to put the effort of getting that sleep to be really good right and of course what you need to also understand is the actually the three pra the third practice that i was um, talking about is the fact that you need to pick the right energy source for your application now if you know how if, if you have been really good at uh, mapping how the power consumption profile of your device works for different user cases you will then also um, understand that you will need an energy source that matches that and um, if you look at the batteries as energy source um, you don't always get in actually rarely you get the um, a lot of information out of the data sheet you get enough to kind of get a far kind of normal usage some kind of ideal usage mm -hmm. but if you really want to go into your corner cases or play a little bit with different firmware and different things you will realize very quickly that it's not giving you um, the right information so here is really really important to profile your battery for the specific um, device and to monitor that throughout the development to see what has changed and uh, I mean, the battery manufacturers can help there, but for the profiling, you can actually do that yourself. So you can actually go to your battery manufacturer and say, well, this is what I'm seeing. Why I'm seeing is that because of the chemistry of the battery? Is that because I, I don't know, have too high peaks and this battery is not really suited for this? Mm -hmm. So you you need to be more involved in that, right? And energy optimizing uh, for, kind of for the whole system and not just saying, well, the capacity is this, this should do and it fits into my device so i'm fine um yeah. that is a kind of old way of doing it um and uh, it's not really feasible to do it nowadays because iot space is about selling services on top of the devices right and if yeah. you can't provide a hygiene battery life you will not be able to get uh, i mean good sustainable business on top of that yeah so you say that actually choosing and selecting the battery even though you're using maybe double a batteries or whatsoever is still the vital part for your iot device yeah absolutely and it is vital that you also check different batches that you that you have a second source right i mean if if you if you have checked um for example for a battery 
and you have tested and you're really confident with that. And then somehow during this um, lifetime of your device, your customer goes and changes the battery for and picks another type of a, like another brand that actually mm -hmm. might be an issue because you haven't tested for that specific brand. And even though they are t kind of same type of the battery, they are not the same type of battery. They're not mm -hmm. same batch. So you, yeah. you really need to make sure that you have covered uh, normal and these corner cases. Um, yeah. so, so you don't end up in having those issues um, on the field or where, with your customer. They're, they're not yeah. going to be especially happy if they if they realize that they, by changing the battery, have um, ruined something. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And this testing is really important because we cannot, like if you develop a new device and put it to the market, like you never know how it's going to operate exactly because you cannot test for five years uh, and only then put it to market. So you have to, you can never wait until the end of the lifetime. No, you can't, but there are ways to speed it up. I mean, this is one of the things that we're doing with our tools that uh, you do kind of a calculated um, uh, ways of speeding up these profiles so you can in a much shorter period of time, say a month, get a, with a certain accuracy or inaccuracy, but still better than just data sheet, you can get the notion of like, what what is it, how is it going to really perform? And I mean, this is the same thing that the battery manufacturers are doing. They they can't really, if you go to them, they will not check, they can't do five years. They are still uh, making a an, an, uh, calculated uh, assumption, I would say, the, the, from the experience and from these um, ways of profiling the batteries um, in a kind of speed up way. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Really interesting. So it's engineering your application, it's, it's engineering the specific sleep, uh, deep sleep modes, and eventually make sure that you really anal analyze the battery that you're going to use and invest yeah. in that Yeah, picking the energy source. Even if you pick the energy harvesting, it's still, still the same thing. You still need to energy optimize. So you really need to make sure that it's um, efficient. There's efficiency in it. So. Picking the right energy source, absolutely. So those are kind of the three uh, practices that uh, you kind of need to have in mind when you are working with it. Great, very clear. So if people want to get started with your tools, um, like where can they get started? Where should they go? So I think they should go definitely to our web page and book a demo. Um, and. Um, it's a coitag.com and uh, you have the, <laughs> the name above it's very obvious uh, mm -hmm. uh book a demo we can show you how the tool works there's a a lot of different um, um technical papers that shows you how you work there are um i'm guessing lawrence you're going to be linking to some of the um spreading factor papers that we have been doing um that people can learn much more about those specific topics so yeah i i would say um, when it comes to engineering um, and for low power, there are, come and uh, talk to us and don't forget and underestimate the fact how much knowledge there is with maybe your fellow firmware developer or hardware developer. Ask them. They have probably seen most of the stuff. And uh, don't underestimate the fact that this is um, a kind of a system level approach which means it's a hardware, it's a firmware, it's a software effort to get this uh, running and getting that kind of low power and long battery life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. good to understand. Great, so thanks a lot for sharing these insights. Is there anything else, any recommendations or advice you want to give the students? Uh, I would say uh, low power mindset actually starts with them now, especially now students, it's a new generation. Um, I think when I studied and when my fellow electrical engineers studied this, this was nothing, this was not really a topic. And I think this is really changing. I think they can be uh, kind of a first generation that has, has this um, um, kind of bringing this from the university into the um, workplace and not just learning it 10 years later. So I kind of have really high hopes that they will embrace this kind of mindset and um, learn and be experts on it. Because I think in five and 10 years, uh, this is something that you just will be a hygiene. You just have to know how to do it. You, you can't just have one expert in a company. Everybody needs to be really good at this. So keep learning right. and measure every day. <laughs>
measure every day. All right. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Vanya, for sharing these insights. I think this is super useful. So I'm going to share some further resources. If you're interested to learn more, I'm going to add this below the video. And yeah. um, thanks a lot for sharing your insights. Thank you for having me. All right. All right. Bye bye. Bye. So keep that in mind um, and everything will be a little bit more clear once we dive into this workshop. So I would like to give the floor to Sebastian Romero who will give a hands-on workshop on how to start developing a LoRaWAN N device using the Arduino platform.